dance friends, and welcome to the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. I'm Courtney Escoin. I'm Lydia Murray. And I'm Amy Brandt. Welcome, listeners, to our second ever mailbag episode, second in what is going to be an ongoing series. Um, So what is a mailbag episode? Well, over the past few weeks, you all have been sending in your suggestions for discussion topics, just dance world ideas and issues you'd like us to get into. And today we will be pulling two of those topics from our digital grab bag for discussion. So this episode's winners are first the upsides and downsides of Zoom dance class, which it looks like is here to stay. And second, a look at why the adult recreational dance world should not be dismissed, at why it matters, which it does. Um, If your topic didn't make it this episode, don't worry, because as I mentioned, we will definitely be doing more mailbag rounds in the not so distant future. So please keep the ideas coming. And the easiest way to share those ideas is on social social media. So make sure you're following the dance edit at the.dance.edit on Instagram and at dance underscore edit on Twitter, and then go ahead and leave us a comment or slide on into our DMs. All right, so let's get right into our first topic, Zoom dance class, um, which was actually suggested by friend of the pod, Gavin Larson. Hi, Gavin. Um, This is a fascinating one because I think in the earlier days of the pandemic, so many dancers were just so fed up with taking class over Zoom that a lot of us assume Zoom classes would be like a COVID blip on the radar. As soon as we were actually back in the studio in person, they would just disappear. Um, that has not proved to be the case. And I think the four of us on this podcast right now have experienced Zoom class from a few different perspectives as like teachers, students, journalistic observers. So I'm curious to hear everyone's thoughts on both the positives and the negatives of Zoom class. Personally, one thing I've liked about Zoom classes is just that they make it easier for me to focus on myself. I feel like if there's ever any temptation to rely on the mirror, that is mm. al- almost non-existent in a Zoom class. Um, you know, for me, since I you know, don't have a mirror that's big enough for that, I also don't worry as much about how I fit into the rest of the class. Um, in person, if I take an open class, I'm more concerned about things like the level, uh, you know, which class will be challenging enough without being so difficult that I get in someone's way or things like, you know, teacher accommodation or, you know, if one of my old injuries flares up, will I be able to modify the combination without disrupting anyone around me and those kinds of things. But kind of more broadly, I think one of the positives is uh, accessibility. Um, You know, Mm -hmm. not everyone can take class in person, whether due to disability or financial concerns or geographical uh, constraints or, you know, I mean, that kind of reminds me of that dance magazine story from last year in September by Jackie Calagridis yeah. that yeah, that focused on those issues. We'll link to that in the show notes. That was a great piece. There's also that great ability to connect with people who are far away or, you know, perhaps in a location that is different from yours uh, where you would otherwise not be able to take class with them or connect with them or just share share that experience. I know with turnout with Tyler and all of those things that were happening. I mean, that wasn't on Zoom, that was on Instagram, but, you know, world ballet class, things like that. It was kind of a fun opportunity to learn from dance stars and other coaches and teachers who otherwise you wouldn't have access to. Yeah, access in a different sense of the word. Yeah. 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 Well, and I know, like, I definitely growing up in South Louisiana, like if I had been told like hey you can literally from your computer take class at these like new york city ballet principles and like all these other people like i would have lost my mind a little bit (laughs) yeah (laughs) but also conversely i know something i experienced early on as a practitioner and am still kind of experiencing is like yes i do like i do surprisingly in my brooklyn apartment like have room to take class if i want to but i still haven't quite been able to bring myself to and i was having Mm. trouble articulating why to myself but then I was talking to some friends who are like not dancer people at all but some of them are like they stream on twitch and they do youtube stuff like you know different sector of the online universe and we were talking about like the thing about zoom fatigue is you're like in this group and you're engaging with people and you're talking with people or in this case dancing with other people even if they're separate from you but then there's the moment of when you log off all of a sudden you're just by yourself in your house none of those people Mm -hmm. you just had that connection with are there. And I had a realization of like the thing that I personally 
felt like I would be missing in a Zoom class, a lot of it had to do with not having that communal ritualistic experience of coming together and taking class and feeling the people in the room with me. So even though like Zoom dance classes absolutely have done an incredible job of like filling that gap, I know personally I was like, I don't know if emotionally I can handle what I feel like is going to be the like stepping away from it that happens in that instant. Well, this is why Zoom classes are never replacing in-person dance. Like in-person energetic exchange you're not going to find a substitute for that on a no. screen. You're just not. I was just talking to a friend about this last night. Who she was she was saying how, you know, her choices at the studio that she sometimes attends to take open class, like her choice is to pay a lot less and take class at home or mm. to have in-person class in a mask. She's like, both of those options aren't really great because she really hates dancing in a mask. But she's like, I would do that in a heartbeat compared to trying to like do class in my living room. So I think it's always kind of preferred to do it in person. <laughs> I've actually, I've heard some people express concerns. I think Teresa Ruth Howard expressed concerns along these lines that what we're going to end up with as studios reopen fully is kind of a tiered system where mm -hmm. it'll cost more to take class in person. And if you can't afford that, or if you can't afford to travel to where the in-person classes are happening, you'll be online in some capacity and you will get a reduced experience. And so mm -hmm. are we going to create then two tiers of, of dance students in a way that's potentially harmful to a, a lot of a lot of students? Right. That's and, something to think about. And it's also worth noting that even though these online classes are increasing accessibility in some senses, not everyone has the privacy or space in their homes to be able to do this. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Or the equipment. Yeah. And there's a number of dancers who were able to like, you know, through personal connections or whatever, leverage having essentially a studio space, which is incredible that they were able to do that. Mm -hmm. But I do question, is this only kind of further widening that gap in terms of who can, in a number of senses, afford to train and dance? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing that I hope we've sort of learned when we had to take class on Zoom that we can then carry back into the in-person environment is I think it pushed teachers to find better language to explain mm. corrections mm -hmm. when they couldn't rely on the body to demonstrate or like physically move a student's body into the correct position. Finding words that explain what you want activates a different kind of learning that begins internally instead of being yes. focused entirely on the external. I think mm -hmm. that connects to what you were saying too, Lydia, about like you can't rely on the mirror. It's a different type of, yeah, of learning, a different sort of processing that's happening. I hope we can bring that back into the studio. I, I think it's helpful for the student too to not rely on the teacher taking the time to show the combination and demonstrate everything, that there's the language of dance that you need to be familiar with too. I mean, I remember taking class with Larry Long, who was this great teacher in Chicago, and he uh, had like mobility issues. So he never demonstrated anything. He would sit on us, you'd finish the combination, he would verbally tell you the combination, go. And that like, you had to like, know vocabulary and, and put it together in your brain. And it did kind of force you to pay close attention in a way that when there's that little break to demonstrate and to, and to watch, you kind of can tune out a little bit oh i had a teacher like that growing up tiny old russian man who would come in with his cane sit in a chair in the front of the room and kind of mutter the mm -hmm. conversation like you had to physically <laughs> come closer to make sure you were hearing what he was saying but man did it help us learn yeah all the terminology yeah. we were sharp i feel like me personally zoom class is sort of best as a special occasion type of thing rather than a consistent method or, you know, consistent uh, medium, you know, a master class, a something to do in case of emergency or whatever, or, but as far as like consistently training on Zoom, I don't know if that's really ideal. Yeah, it all comes back to, it's not going to replace in-person classes, but it's also not going anywhere. So yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to see how the dance world's use of it evolves over time and how it affects training in in a bigger picture sense over time. Yeah, I could see it being a great supplement to in-person training. But yes, definitely agree that it, it has its limitations and probably can't really replace, you know, an on the ground uh, class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So next up out of the mailbag is the importance of the adult recreational dance world, which is a suggestion from listener Rachel Taburin. And 
Thank you, Rachel, because yes, adult rec dancers are just written off by studios and teachers and the wider dance world all the time for a variety of reasons. Um, but they make up a not insignificant portion of the dance student population. They should be taken seriously and their experiences and their contributions matter. And Amy, I know you said in our pre-recording correspondence we were doing that point readers in particular are very passionate about this topic. They are actually. Um, we actually, we cross posted an article from Dance Magazine by Lindsay Martell, uh, Why Adult Ballet Students Should Be Taken Seriously. And it got so much engagement on our social media and it really opened our eyes. And and in the past, I've also heard from people kind of asking us to, to create more content geared towards that community. And, bef- you know, when we were a print publication, we were very much geared towards a younger dancer, a pre-professional student, someone in the early years of their professional life. Mm -hmm. And so there wasn't really space for that. But now that we're completely digital, we've kind of broadened our coverage. And so we are starting to look into publishing more stories from that, that world. And they do really well. Like we've, we've done a few on, you know, summer programs for adult students. And we did one recently on, you know, how to return to the studio after a year of Zoom class, you know, on an adult body, mm-hmm. not a fundamentally different proposition. Or, yeah. yeah. And we have another story in the works about starting point as an adult and how that's different and what your how the need your needs are a little bit different than when you're 12. And, and you know, when you think about it, this is the ballet audience, too. Mm-hmm. These are the people who are buying the tickets who have really invested in dance as an art form. And I think it's important to make sure that they are informed and that they feel part of the dance community like growing up in my early training uh when i was like i don't know like middle school early high school uh there was some there was like an adult class at my studio uh but one of the guys in it uh his name was john and he was like in his early 60s had never danced before in his life was like an engineer and he decided he wanted to start taking ballet and he was one of the most delightful presences to have in the studio because he was there just because he was like really interested in it and really loved it and he knew that he had different physical limitations but like I think like having that perspective in the studio alongside a bunch of us who were like wanted to be professionals and were like so like ah about it and just having this person who was like also dedicated to doing the work but it's also like hey like you can you can chill out a little bit like your life is going to be really long totally and having that perspective alongside was so valuable just for like me as a you know perfectionist obsessive kid Mm -hmm. um we did an interview a little while back with richard riaz yoder who's the i mean brilliant tap dancer broadway dancer and he said that he started training the class that his mom found for him was a class that was mostly older women. And that was the environment that he was in for the first several years of his training. And he said it was just the best way to enter dance. Mm. Because you're just around all these people who are completely at home in their own bodies, know exactly what their limitations are, are there because they love it. And that's it. There is no other like end goal. It's just I want to be in this classroom right now. Imagine if more kids started out that way. And not that the benefit of adult recreational dancers is only to the children who Mm -hmm. see them, but like it it is nice to have that kind of role model in the classroom. Yeah, I think for a lot of teachers, that kind of all consuming dedication and that ability to embody, you know, the traditional aesthetic ideals of ballet um, is kind of seen as essential to studying ballet. When really it's about so much more than that. And I, I think that it's it's like you're saying, it's great to be able to have those Uh, people with different goals and different perspectives, and not just creatively, but also just to kind of, you know, meet people who do a lot of different things outside the dance world. And on an interpersonal level, it's it's really good to have that experience when you're, you know, a pre-professional or or growing up. I remember when I was um, dancing with the Suzanne Farrell Ballet, we were at the Kennedy Center, and we had a, uh, um, we used to give like master classes there when we were in season. And I was tasked with teaching an adult master class, you know, for the company. And I was kind of nervous because I wasn't sure what they would be able to do. And I didn't want to hurt them and, um, and all of that. But they were so much fun. 
I mean, I, I was like t- giving them a stretch and I was like, let me know if this hurts you. And I mean, they were all into it. And Grand Allegro, you name it, they, they were so pumped. It was one of the best teaching experiences I've had. It was so much fun. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is that uh, I think teachers maybe sometimes aren't as excited about teaching adult students because they have no professional prospects. But yeah, what that actually means is that the class isn't a means to an end. It's the whole point. Like they're super mm-hmm. excited to be in that classroom. And that's exactly what you want of your students. You want them to be fully invested and present there. And they're coming with an adult mentality. Yes. You know, there's things that they just immediately understand, even if they physically don't have the coordination or the ability, they like intellectually understand what you're talking about. And that's really fun and refreshing. It's a different kind of student that you work with, you know. And and I think there's also something to be said about like coming into a dance practice as an adult when you like, you know who you are and you know what your value is outside of this thing that you are working towards. And like, you know, I think that's something that like we've discussed a lot, uh, being Mm -hmm. like something that to be looked out for in pre-professional dancers because like you're basically pursuing an impossible ideal while like your sense of who you even are is like and your sense of self-worth is like forming and I think we can all speak to and acknowledge the ways that like sometimes that isn't handled great and sometimes that creates like lasting impacts on a person's personality Mm -hmm. and like you know I think there's something really kind of special and incredible about like coming at it And you know who you are already. Yeah. And you're doing this to do it. Right. And it's also great to have, from the perspective of someone taking adult classes, it's really great um, when you have classmates who also have backgrounds in, you know, pre-professional, you know, ballet training or or whatever, um, who maybe did have those struggles when they were younger. And now they have, you know, worked through that. And it's, it's just really great to to see, I guess, that it, it kind of, it's also just good to kind of be in the company, I guess, of someone with that experience, because it's somehow, I don't know, healing to you too. Yeah, shared past trauma that you've both. Yeah, I was like trying to spin it in a more positive way, because I was like, this is sounding really <laughs> negative. Um, but yeah. <laughs> but there, I mean, the sense of like, okay, that pressure has been removed. Now you can just focus on the the joy of it which like also i feel like the term recreational in dance generally has gotten a bad rap like even when you talk about younger students who are recreational dancers it's like oh well they're not serious enough or talented enough to be pre-professional it's like why why does that why is there a stigma associated with this word Mm -hmm. what if kids who just want to dance who have no professional aspirations so what that's great come welcome there's so much more that dance can can teach you besides you know, a career. I mean, you know, it, dance can give you so much. Yeah. And and I think also, like, the vast majority of dance students aren't going to go professional. And, mm-hmm. like, there are so no. many more dance students who don't, who do it for, like, a year or two or several years or until they, you know, graduate high school, whatever the case may be. And treating them as less than in any way, in a lot of ways, is, like, setting them up to not care about dance when they are adults with disposable income and are the people that you want to have butts in seats when it comes to selling tickets to shows. Hello. Right. Hello. Hello. It's we're not just cultivating prof- professional dancers, we're cultivating audiences. Exactly. I mean, yeah, from a business perspective, it makes so much sense to engage that segment of the dance community. And like Amy was saying, saying earlier, I mean, they they bring so much enthusiasm to the art form, um, you know, and, and they're willing to support the art form. And that's important. Yeah. I think we could all keep talking about this for another three hours. Probably. <laughs> there's, so much, there's so much to unpack here. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, thank you again to Rachel for submitting that question. Clearly lots to say about it. All right. That concludes this special mailbag episode thanks everyone for joining us we will be back soon with more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world keep learning keep advocating and keep dancing mind here you go friends bye everyone see you later everybody The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Amy Brandt, Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, and Lydia Murray. 
Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those footfall sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.